Flag Church, how are we doing this morning? We doing all right? I just took a picture when Anthony was showing that Pitt Naz thing up there. I took a photo of that and texted it over to Pastor Kyle over there. I had lunch with him this past week. Just let him know we're celebrating with him this morning. And a story that uh, wasn't shared. I got a conversation yesterday with someone at the Kyle Alpha Tailgate who had probably had uh, probably one, two, or forty-five too many pieces of alcohol in the system. But uh, he kept talking about how is it too late? Is it too late? Is it too late? And the conversation went pretty powerful. We thought it was too late for him to get saved. Too late for Jesus. It's too late. It's too late. And you go, yeah, but I'm a blankety blank blank, and I've done all this blankety blank blank stuff. It's too late for me. And we just had a great conversation. I know it's hard to have a conversation with someone who's drunk, but we had a good conversation. It was pretty obvious. He's just resisting grace. So he just had all these bad things about himself, and I said, you're right. You're absolutely accurate. And God says, I'm willing to pay your debt anyways. He goes, no, no, that's not right. It's not fair. I need to pay for this. I'm the blankety blank blank blank. Resisting grace. Isn't it amazing? And we never even once even told him, hey, we're doing this in Jesus' name and you need to get saved. We're just there as a church and they know that we're not there just doing good deeds because we want to be good humans. And we're saying, hey, we're trying to show you God loves you in a practical way. The conviction of the Holy Spirit fell on him and that conversation was healthy. And then he disappeared into the abyss that is known as the pit state tailgating. And but seeds were planted. And obviously someone planted a seed in him a long time ago that he even knew that he was away from God. So I'm thankful for those opportunities. But we don't have those opportunities. Those tailgates are costing about $250 a piece for all we put into it. So thank you for putting resources in our hands so that we can do those kind of outreaches. We are in week three of our series on guardrails, talking about what is a guardrail. It's a voluntary barrier that prevents disaster because we want to make sure that the guardrails are just right. You don't want to have them too hard. You run into concrete, it's going to hurt you. Or too soft, we're going to go right over the edge. And you want to have them a safe place from severe danger. So you get to place where you want to put it. Just make sure you put it in a spot where you have some margin for error. The, uh, we want to make sure that we have them wherever we have the possibility of losing control because we want to be careful there. And we need to set them up before we need them, but maybe also after we need them in case you've blown through some. Because you never know when they might come up and they might, you might need them. Um, a regret would not exist if a guardrail had existed. What regrets in your life would not exist had you had a guardrail in place? Because it's a whole lot better to have this dent have this dent on this side of the guardrail then, and a ding in your life than to have it on the other side around. And for some of you that are wondering, we only have one more week and then this will disappear forever. Everyone says amen. Awesome. Good, good, good. Uh, the key is to live as wise. We can rewind and look at it as, a, hey, what regrets would not exist, but what regrets won't exist in the future if we establish guardrails now? Not just tell other people to establish guardrails, but establish them ourselves and put them in place in our life because our culture baits us to the edge of disaster our culture tells us to come and flirt as close as possible and then if they go over the edge everyone's willing to vilify them and mock them all over the place on social media as well as tv especially those that we consider to be important like celebrities and politicians and those who have fame but a god who loves you has invited you to come as a father to say hey instead of having a major disaster just have a small accident and let's have conflict on this side instead of the other side and you tune your conscience so that when the guardrail you hit it an alarm goes off and tells you i don't want to go any farther last week we talked about how this uh, principle works out when it costs about friendship about friendship and relationships that our greatest regrets frequently involve our friends not our enemies uh he who walks with the wise grows wise but a companion of fools suffers harm even if you never become foolish and we had powerful altar times and all the services a third service the altar was filled edge to edge edge to edge in the third service and what's the difference between all the services pastor it, all the services are, are different totally usually generally there's more mature believers in the first service and i'm not making a, a, a side crack about age it's not it's not but very few people that are new in their faith are going to come to the 830 service there's very few visitors are going to be in the 830 service. Yeah, I think I'll consider that. I've been going to the church for five years. I'll be glad to get up at 730 and make it to church. They don't do that. They come to the 1130 service. 
So the maturity level and the faith level in the 1130 service is totally different. The connection level in this service is way different. Most of you can name 10 or 15 people in the service right now. They can't do that in the 1130. But together we'll be at one service, 10 o'clock, first Sunday next month, and I'm looking forward to that opportunity as well. And so we talked about some guardrails that you need to consider when it comes to friendships. But many of our regrets happen because of friends, but in the life group that I attend, my life group leader, Todd McKnight, was talking last Sunday night, and he was talking about, uh, hey, this guardrails thing, what do you think about it? He started throwing some questions out there and talked about, hey, you know, some of the stuff Mark's saying is causing us to squirm a little bit. Causing us to go, uh, just tell me what I need to do. Pastor, don't, just, don't leave it open where I've got to decide where I put this and use wisdom. Just tell me what to do. And I said, well, good news. The next two subjects are very easy. Sex and money. Won't those go over really well? They're like, I'm glad I'm not talking about that. I'm glad I'm not talking about that. The, uh, but what if our nation, because our nation, our culture dismisses what Scripture says about sex and money. It just dismisses it as outdated and unrealistic. What if our nation took a six-month trip? A six-month trip and everyone in the culture obeyed what the scripture had to say about sex and money, just for six months. Not even because they, 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 were, they, they were being uh, spiritual about it, just because they were going to try an experiment. What would happen to our families? What would happen to the schedule in counselors' offices? Would lawyers have to start advertising more because their, the number of clients that they would need would go down? What would happen to the court system and the prison population and the welfare? What would happen economically? if we started following God on this. He's not a God trying to take away our joy. He's trying to give us a safe place to land. So next week, we're going to talk about the idea of guardrails in marriage, relationships, singleness, and intimacy. This week is about guardrails and money and greed. How can we be on guard against greed? This morning, as I sit here on this country road, with a ditch on both sides, I find myself seated between two guardrails. These guardrails are in place to protect the motorist from driving off the road that could in turn cause a lot of harm. This is the same when it comes to the area of our finances. We find that there are two ditches that we can fall into that can get us in some serious hurt in our life. One is the consumer ditch, the other the hoarder ditch. The consumer finds themselves spending all their money on acquiring stuff that they feel they really need, which in turn causes them to spend more than what they have. This in turn leads them past the guardrail into the ditch of debt. The hoarder swings the pendulum in the opposite direction and finds themselves storing up treasure, money, for the big crisis in their life that may or may not happen. Don't hear what I'm not saying. There is nothing wrong with saving and being wise with our finances for the future. But when you start to get overboard, we find ourselves in the ditch of ordering. Here are some truths about the consumer and the hoarder. They are both self-centered. The consumer is all about using all resources he or she has to obtain stuff to benefit them. The hoarder holds back all resources he or she has to protect themselves from the unseen challenges of life that may or may not come their way. In both of these cases, it's all about themselves equals self-centeredness. Truth number two, they both live as if there is no God. The consumer says, it's all about me. How can I satisfy my wants? How can I satisfy my desires? And once that is done, there is none left for God. The hoarder is all about saving everything they earn so that their safety net is in the accumulation of their wealth and with no dependence on God. Truth number three, they are both fueled by greed. The consumer is always looking for the next best thing and is too greedy to share their wealth with the person in need. The hoarder is too greedy to let go of the wealth in fear of losing the security of needing it for later in case of a life emergency. So we see the need for guardrails for both the consumer and the hoarder. You know what these people do, don't you? They usually marry each other. <laughs> there is a saying, 
If God can get it through you, He will get it to you. Is God able to get it through you? Or is your consumer-driven or hoarder-driven lifestyle preventing Him from getting it to you? What guardrails do you have to keep you from falling into either of these ditches? I can understand most every word he said, too. That's pretty good, huh? Go ahead and pull your bulletins out, and let's go ahead and start hitting the notes this morning. First thing we're talking about is the personality of greed. If you didn't get a bulletin, lift your hand up, and we've got some people to make sure that you get one. Personality of greed. The scripture says, and you may be familiar with this verse, uh, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's not all evil, but it's a root of it, all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, and this is the spot we forget, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Okay, pastor, you're going to talk to us about greed and money. Okay, I get that, but what's the big deal if I have a little bit of debt? What's the big deal about this? It's caused people to lose their faith. Loving money and greed has caused people to walk away from Jesus. Do not think that we, you are immune. I will not think that I will ever become immune from that. Uh, greed does not discriminate. It does not discriminate. Greed is great for America because it could be at the bottom of anything. This does not discriminate against blah, 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 blah. Greed does not discriminate by age, by race, by education, by gender, by faith. Greed does not discriminate by income. There's people who have twice as much money in you as you and are way less greedy than, than you and I. And there's people that have half as much money as we do and are twice as greedy as we are. Greed does not discriminate. Greed has never been considered a desirable quality. Have you ever heard somebody say, I'm so proud of my kids, they're greedy. We never hear that. Greed gives in to the enemy's will for your life and greed never accomplishes what God wants to do. Uh, uh, greed's hard to see in the mirror. We can see it in other people like that, can't we? Man, man, that's greedy. Man, they're greedy. They're greedy. But it's hard to see in yourself. We all know greedy people. We just don't think we are one of those. So we compare ourselves to people that are really greedy that makes us look a little bit better. You know, when that athlete leaves your team because he was only making $5 million a year and now he's making $10 million a year, he's greedy. But if you leave your job when you're making forty five a year so you can get a job making $60,000 a year, you're just being good for your family. Something's off with that. Something's off with that. Have you ever noticed the people that we generally think are greedy have more than us? Why would that be? Maybe we're judging by wrong motives. Because greed sneaks up on you. Greed sneaks up on you. You ever do this? You go to sell something online on eBay or on SEK by Sell and Trade, and you go, you know what? I'd be happy if I got 50 bucks for this. And you post it, and 10 minutes later, 45 people want it, and they're offering you $100, and you're going, stink! I could have got 100 bucks out of that! You smell that? That's greed. 15 minutes ago, you were very comfortable to get $50 out of it, and you were hoping somebody was interested. You were very comfortable with $50. There was no problem getting $50 out of it. But because someone would offer you $100, all of a sudden you're discontent, mad, upset. And I'm not saying don't, you should have sold it for 90 You probably should have sold it for 90 But you still got 50 What changed? What changed? How has greed snuck up on you in your past? It snuck up on all of us for sure. And how are you sensing greed in your life right now, trying to make its attack on you, not just so it can make you go backwards financially, but that you can wander from the faith? What guardrails against greed do you need to have in place, or do you already have in place? So I want to share a couple guardrails about greed, because we need financial guardrails, and we're all susceptible to crossing the lines financially, whether you are one of those consumer people, or you're one of those hoarder people, and you'll eventually probably, if you get married, you will marry the opposite, because thumb and forefinger is actually go really well together. Think about that. But what guardrails do you have set up against greed? What I want to share with you are some biblical principles that you need to keep in mind and then set the guardrails up appropriately. Number one, avoid debt for depreciating assets. Avoid debt for depreciating assets. The scripture is very plain. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant. Some translations say slave. The borrower is servant to the lender. Greed frequently baits us into impulse and unnecessary purchases that are way beyond getting that Snickers bar at the checkout counter. Easy credit enables us to give in to greed. And I am the poster child for that. Absolutely. In my 20s and early 30s, horrible. Horrible. It took me over 10 years to pay off the credit card debt. When we moved here, you know, you've heard me say, well, I was at the big church with a big salary over in Wichita. And when I moved here and took over the church of 30 and took it down to 25, I moved with about $10,000 of credit card debt. $10,000 of credit card debt. 
a piece of electronics I had to buy, something that I had to buy that I sold at a garage sale five years later that I sold for like 20% of what I bought it for. I wish I could find the picture. I can't, but I had a Mercedes at one time. A 1974 Brown uh, 240D. It was a diesel. It was this big old stinking steering wheel. It was awesome. I loved it. Paid $2,000 for it. I paid cash for it because I was paying all my grocery bills and everything on credit card. I didn't have no stinking car payment, but I was paying for everything else on credit card and just paying off what I could and having all that interest. And Oh, I didn't, forgot to tell you, that was our third car. Yeah, yeah. And Connor wasn't even born yet. We were, double in, we were dinkwads. Double income, no kids with a dog. And we couldn't afford to buy a house. That's why we were renting a duplex, a little dumpy duplex for $450 a month. We couldn't afford to buy a house. But I could afford to buy a third car and not be able to pay the credit card debt off. Financial freedom is not based on you getting more money. It's not how you earn it. It's how you spend it. There are people who make twice as much as you and are in total financial bondage. Do you agree or disagree? Use your voice. There are people who have half as much money as you, but they're in financial freedom. Agree or disagree? It's how we spend. It's not how we earn. What controls how we spend? We do. Have some guardrails in place. Here's a simple thought on the guardrail. Pray before you pay. Sounds ridiculous, Pastor. It's ridiculous. I'm not going to pray before I buy a Snickers. Yeah, you shouldn't pray before you buy a Snickers. Absolutely. But what about a car? What about, uh, what about that $700 appliance because the old one can be repaired for 50 bucks? What if it's a $700 brand new appliance and the old one can be repaired for $450? What's the right balance? You need wisdom there. You need wisdom. But here's the thought I had even as I was studying this morning. Just because you qualify doesn't justify. Every one of us can probably qualify for more car than we should afford. Could you get it because you qualify? Every one of us could probably qualify for more house than is reasonable for us to purchase. Should we take it? Should we do it? Greed will bait you to the edge of disaster and so will our culture. And then when you go over the edge, it will laugh at you and buy it on repo price and on a foreclosure price. We all have items we wish we would not have purchased. Whether as an adult, a house that you wish you wouldn't have purchased. In your 20s, a car you wish you hadn't purchased. Although I still love that Mercedes. Whether it was in college, a whole semester you wish you hadn't purchased. That was a total waste of time and you're still paying it off. Or whether it was a teenager and it's a video game system or shoes you wish you hadn't purchased. Or nine years old and you took all your Christmas money from grandma and bought a toy that broke in a month. Because you saw it on TV and you had to buy it. We all have bought things we wish we hadn't. How do we prevent that? Not going to prevent it perfectly. How do we limit that? Biblical principle number two, be content with what you have. All those things were probably bought because we weren't content with what we had. And Scripture puts it like this. I said be content with what you have. Scripture says be content with what you have. (laughs) That's the exact same thing. Why? Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Why can you be content with what you have? Because God will never leave you and never forsake you. Do not hear what is not being said. This does not mean we have an apathetic attitude towards finances. This does not mean we lack ambition. This does not mean we not go forward. That does not mean we don't pursue an education so we can earn more money. This does not mean if the boss says, I'd like to give you 10% raise, you go, no, thank you. I'm content with what I have. That is not at all what we're saying. But greedy people are discontent, and they are not satisfied with what they have. And all the appetites in your life have a one-word vocabulary, more. Appetite for food, appetite for pleasure, appetite for popularity, appetite for money has a one-word vocabulary, more. And we have to tell our appetites, no, or it will take us down. I only showed you part of that verse, though. Let me show you the whole rest of it. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Keep your lives free from the love of money. doesn't mean you can't have money. Some of the best saints in the uh, entire Scriptures were extremely wealthy. But you you keep your lives free from the love of money because God has said, I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. If he's the source of contentment, how would your, what would change if you spent more time listening to his word and his voice and the Holy Spirit's nudging on your heart than all the, giving your attention to all the advertisements online and on TV that are telling you the exact opposite? What would happen to your finances? What would happen to your stress level if we listened to him a little bit more and a little bit less to everyone who's trying to get us to part with our money. So when we think about that, a topic comes up in our culture. Gambling. I just saw yesterday, I didn't, I didn't even know this, but the casino apparently got stopped from being continued to go on because the other ones are suing over where it's going to be at. Let me share a verse with you. First Timothy chapter 6. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to a young pastor. 
And he's telling, he's telling the young pastor, here's, how, here's what I want you to tell the people. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Gee, that's so unrelevant to our society, man. It just doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Actually, it's totally our color. There's all sorts of levels of gambling, man. There's the casino. There's different levels. They've got the slot machine, the roulette. That's basically all luck. There's blackjack and poker. It's got a little bit of skill. There's raffles and lottery. Then that stupid thing called fantasy football. Seriously, man, I'm almost ready to turn off the sports talk radio because all they're telling me is, how are you going to win $2 million for the biggest payouts at all? It's nothing but gambling. Personal guardrail, I don't and I won't. Anything that is proven addictive and is designed to take my money? Tell me how that's wise. I'll, I'll be glad to listen anyway. Tell me how that's wise. All my experience with gambling is through other people, and none of it's been good. No one's ever said, Pastor, you see how we've been putting down, we've been in financial trouble on our prayer cards, but man, we went to the casino, and now we're doing awesome. I learned how to count cards in blackjack, Pastor, and now we have no financial problems. I've never had that conversation with anybody. But I don't want to be an American Christian. That's not what our guideline is. That's not what our, gu- our guardrail and our guideline is. It's God's word. Nowhere in the scriptures, no matter what language or translation you want to get, does it say, thou shalt not play blackjack. You go to old-time Pentecostals, they wouldn't even let cards in their house. You couldn't have playing cards in your house. Hey, man, yeah, we got to have... So what did we do in Bible college? We didn't have playing cards. We played rook. We played rook because there wasn't playing cards. Anyway, we could get around it. So what am I going to do? The Bible does speak very, very plainly and directly to the person who wants to get wealthy without using work. And it doesn't hesitate. So what am I going to do if I have a conference and the conference is in Vegas. What would you think if your pastor was in Vegas? That'd be all right? I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy a $100 ticket to go see Blue Man Group. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to see him up in Kansas City with 7,000 other people. I'm going to see him with like 150, 160 people in that, in that Luxor Theater, and I'm going to watch Blue Man Group. Pastor, how is you spending $100 on Blue Man Group any different than someone going to the casino spending $100 on entertainment? There's not. There's not. So where are you going to put your guardrail? I have a pretty good idea that when I walk into Blue Man Group, I'm not going to walk out with more money. There's no temptation for me to go to the ATM in the middle of Blue Man Group concert so the concert will go longer. There is no temptation. I have no false expectation that I'm going to walk out with more than I entered with, and I have no expectation of staying at Blue Man Group until I break even. It is 100% an entertainment purchase. So I'm not going to judge the person who twice a year thinks this is an okay form of entertainment and they cap their losses and they have that much self-control but I'll tell you straight up you are playing with a lion that is trying to devour you and is scientifically set up to get as much out of you as possible and the odds are literally and legally and politically stacked against you it is not wise it is not wise avoid debt for depreciating assets pastor said it's sin he did not say that the scripture doesn't say that avoid debt for depreciating assets be content with what you have and lastly don't block heaven's blessings. Don't block heaven's blessings. When people hit a bump financially, what do they do? They may max out credit cards, but one of the first things they do when they hit a bump financially is they pray. They find out where God is. Sometimes they find their Bible and <laughs> blow the dust off, and they're going to say, where is it talking in the Bible about God and prayer and money? And if they're a consumer, and they're in that consumer ditch, and they run out of money, and the credit bar- card bills come, and the gas bills do, and they start praying. If they're a hoarder and they get sick and they lose their job, they got to tap into the savings, they start praying. Because they think, and our culture thinks, whether they're a follower of Christ or not, that somehow, some way, that if there's a financial problem, God could maybe pull some strings. That somehow, some way, he either has resources or, or he controls when the escrow check comes from the mortgage or he controls the boss's decision on whether I They think that maybe God can help us. The New Testament is very clear. God has no desire to help us. He wants to rule and reign over us. Big difference. He is not set up to be our servant. We are set up to be his servant. Not to be treated like a dog that says, God, stay there until I need you. Stay, stay. Okay, I need you. Come. What if when those financial bumps come, and they will, whether you honor God with your finances or you do not, what if when those financial bumps come, you're already in a position where God's already ruling and reigning in that area of your life? And so you've already invited God into the equation with obedience and not just a demanding request that probably will not be met. 
Now, when I say the next part of the message, give a reminder for those you may not know, I have no idea who gives what financially in this church at all. The board does, I do not. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. God has a conversation with his people, and he says, Will a man rob God? But you rob me. And the people respond, Hey, how do we rob you, God? And God responds, and says, In tithes and offerings. And God continues, You're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Now, my life of crime kind of stopped in second grade when I got caught shoplifting a candy bar. But it actually didn't because I kept stealing quarters off my dad's, uh, dad's dresser because he had a ton up there. And there was this thing that was, I was getting addicted to. Anyone ever hear of space invaders? Oh, yeah, I knew how to count and everything and get all the 15, 23 shots will get you to the 300 spaceship and then 15 shots will get you to the 300 spaceship and addicted. Baiting me to the edge until I would do things that would be considered wrong and I did them. Have you ever stolen something? We pretty much all have at some time, but not me. Your pastor doesn't say this. God says this. If I don't tithe, I'm embezzling from God. And don't define tithe how you want. Tithe is a word that means 10%. If you're going to give a tithe of your time, it's 10% of your time. If you're going to give a, a tithe out of a, a, a vat of uh, oil or something, it's 10%. It's a tithe. I'm stealing from the owner of the business. and It's my business, but he owns it. And what's, what, what does this mean, under a curse? Is that like a wicked witch kind of thing? Here's what the curse looks like. You've planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you don't have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You you earn wages, only put them in a a, uh, a, uh, man bag. Man bag, yeah, yeah. Put them in a man bag with holes in it. Does that describe where you are? That you are doing your absolute stinking best, but it's still not good enough. Could it be that you're worried that your best isn't best enough when in reality it's not that your best isn't best enough, it's that your best isn't blessed? Let me say that again. It's not the fact that you're not doing your best. It's the fact that your best isn't being blessed. You're proving yourself faithful instead of God. If your income dropped by 10% and your boss came in and said, hey, I'm going to cut your pay 10%, you might look for another job, but would you go bankrupt? Or would you die? Probably not. So the situation is not whether you could live on 10% less. The issue is whether you'll do it voluntarily as worship or if you would do it if it was forced upon you. And God doesn't force it on us. Pastor, I'm doing my best. Is it blessed? The scripture continues. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent the pests from devouring your crops. If you want to make the translation just, I will prevent the, the, the scissors from cutting those holes in your pockets where you keep, feel like you're putting your money into holes in your pockets. And the vines in your field will not cast their fruit. The work you're doing won't come to nothing. So what does it mean to be blessed? Someone's watching out for you. There's value added from a higher source protecting you and guarding you. What would change in your whole level of stress if generosity displaced greed? Because giving is the antidote to greed. What if God's blessing replaced your best? What if it wasn't based on your effort? but on his blessing. And not about extraordinary giving and taking everything you have and selling it at all and giving it to the poor. What if it's just based on being obedient? But systematic sacrifice instead of spasmodic outbursts of generosity. His kingdom first, my kingdom second. My personal guardrail, I will not trade God's blessings for a stinking 10% of my income. I will not trade it. I have tithed for 25 plus years in my life. I didn't get saved when I was out of high school. I tithe on the gross. And we do this on both our incomes without fail. To withhold what belongs to God is a bad trade. I will not make that trade. I did not say you will go straight to hell and do not pass go, do not collect $200 if you do not tithe. I did not say that. I did say, I would encourage you, don't block heaven's blessings because you want to hold on to 10%. And how strongly do I feel about that? It's what I teach my son. And it's not because I want to have to pay for more of his expenses. And it's not because I want him to give his money to a local church when I'm old and I need it for a better retirement home. Because I don't want him to be owned by what he owns. And I don't want him to be owned by what he owes. And right now he hates debt more than I do. And amazing, we didn't get out of debt at the big church. We got out of debt here and we've been debt free for over five years. The only debt we have is our house. God is able. And what does he want? He wants your heart. What's the chief competition for your heart? Jesus said it was money. I don't think that's right. You disagree with the man that rose from the dead, not me. Worship team, please come on up. Jesus said where your treasure is, 
That's where your heart's going to be. Money leads, heart follows. There is nothing in your life that you love that does not cost you money. Even if you love crazy things like the Denver Broncos or the Oakland Raiders or the Dallas Cowboys or the Chiefs, if you love them, it has cost you money. We, even if it's just $10, put a front license plate on your car that makes it look like you don't know what you're doing because you're driving with a Chiefs license plate on your car. If you love it, it costs you money. If you say you, if I told you I loved something and you asked me how much money have you spent on that in your lifetime, I said nothing. That what you love, you'll spend money on. Your Heavenly Father's calling you to a place of safety. Does greed have a grip on you? And if it does, what could it feel like if that grip was released? Would you stand with me this morning? Father, I ask for your presence to come in to impress your word and your truths on our heart and to give us wisdom and discernment how we need to walk wisely in this area that can so easily take us down and according to your word, take us away from our faith.